last January, um, yeah, I'll even say it was on Martin Luther King Day. This is what happened. This is one of the craziest things that's ever happened to me in my whole entire life. Um, I was ret- I had to return a video camera downtown Chicago, and that's about a 40-minute drive for me. And I had both my daughters because school was out, and we were getting in the car, and I got to return the camera, and there's a blizzard. And I'm talking, you know, inches of snow, Chicago blizzard. It's not the kind of, you don't want to take your kids on the highway for, for a, a joyride. But I got to take this camera back or I'm going to get dinged hundreds of dollars. It was a, a very expensive high-definition camera. So I get in the car and we're driving. And I always take the same road to Chicago. And I'm on the road and, Ch- and God is telling me to take a different way, to take the long way, to take the toll way. And this is six miles out of my way and I got to pay like $5 in tolls. And that makes absolutely no sense because there's a snowplow in front of me. And it's going to take even longer because I'm going to be stuck behind a snowplow for five miles. And he's going 10 miles an hour. And I'm wrestling with this, and God keeps saying, go straight, go the long way. So I do it. And now I'm going down the highway. So then I finally get to the highway. I'm so frustrated because it's taking me so much longer. And I get on the tollway, and immediately, as soon as I get on the tollway, there's a, a semi-truck on its side in the median. And the, his, his trailer is on the other side of the expressway, blocking all four lanes of traffic. And everyone on my side is just driving past this guy. And I pull over. I get out of my truck, I tell my girls to stay in the car, I get out of my truck, and I'm telling you, man, I've never seen an accident this bad. I couldn't eat, the whole roof was like sheared off from the, the light pole that had been wrapped around this thing, uh, the front end is bashed in, and there's blood everywhere. I'm talking, it looks like it, like he hit a deer, there's like pine, there's just blood everywhere, man, in the snow. So when you see that red in the white snow, it stops me dead in my tracks because I'm not, I'm not that type of guy. I get squeamish at other people's blood. And I said, dear Lord, this man doesn't even have a head. There's no way he's even alive. And I cannot even take one step closer to that truck because I cannot even bear what that looks like. I said, but God, if you want me over there, I'll go over there. And no sooner did I say that, I saw a hand come out of the wreckage waving for me to come over. So I ran over there, and I had to, I had to climb over this, the railing and climb over the tr- into the truck and I look into the truck, and this guy's face has been rearranged. His jaw is over to the side. The, the piece of bone that's between your mouth and your nose is over to the other side. His cheekbones are crushed in, and there's a hole in his forehead, and his skull is hanging out, and I can practically see his brains, and blood is shooting out with every heartbeat. Okay? And I almost threw up in this guy's face because I had never seen anything that horrible in my entire life. And I said, dear Lord, please, somebody help me. And I started screaming out. And a guy comes up and he throws his coat. And it was a white lambskin lining, inner lining of the coat. And I looked at the man and I said, you're not going to get your coat back, friend. And he said, that's fine, take it. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm hanging upside down into this truck because it's, it's sideways on, on the driver's side, on the median, on the concrete median as I've gone through the, through the truck. And this truck is still on and the wheels are still spinning and the engine is still shaking. And everyone's standing Everyone's standing 100 feet away from this thing because they don't know if it's going to explode or what. And I don't. And I don't, I'm sitting there going, "What am I even doing in this thing?" And I put his face in the. Uh, he was pinned in there. I couldn't even see his body. I don't even know if his if he's got internal bleeding. Nothing. I, I don't know. But he's bleeding everywhere. He's bleeding on me. And I I put his face in the in the white lambskin coat. And and I told his brother. I said, "Hey man, I go. My name's Victor, and I'm going to stay with you until the until the paramedics get here. All right." And I'm sitting there, and I'm just holding him, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, this man's going to die in my hand. I've never even seen somebody die in my whole life, and this guy's going to die in my hands. W- what do you do with someone that's going to die in your hands? Okay, well, you share Jesus with them is what you do. So I just started telling him, hey, man, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? He loves you so much. He sent his only son to die for you, and that's how much he loves you, man. And I just started sharing the love of Jesus with this guy the best I knew how and I got filled with the Holy Spirit and I'll tell you this man I don't know if there was angels in that truck with me but it felt like it and I felt the presence of God in that truck and I'm crying out to God and I don't even remember what I was saying because I'm just speaking in tongues and I'm just pouring out and I'm just crying out to God for the, this whole time and sharing the love of Christ and trying to walk him through this plan of salvation the best I know 
And then finally, about 15 or 20 minutes later, the paramedics get there and they're trying to figure out if the truck's going to blow up and what to do and how to get this guy. And they're, you know, they're they're figuring all that out. And finally, they were able to relieve me and get in there and support his neck and get him kind of supported and figure out how to cut him out. So I get out of there and I am holding the coat and I look at the coat and there's like no blood in this thing, man. I'm talking like maybe the size of a quarter of blood in this coat. And this guy was bleeding. He he bled, he bled like a stuck pig for 30 seconds to a minute. And I held this guy for 20 minutes and he didn't bleed. And I'm looking at this coat like, what's, what's going on here? This thing should be, this should be a bloodbath. And I'm really confused. And now I'm thinking, now there's condemnation. I'm thinking, what did I do wrong? It's always about me. What did I know? I did it all wrong. I didn't stop the pressure. I screwed up. I didn't do it right. The guy ran out of blood. He died. He couldn't talk. I didn't even know, you know, if he's listening, if he's conscious. I couldn't even tell. So I drive down the highway because I got a video camera to return. That's all I can think about. Now I'm all shaken up. I'm covered in blood. And I'm like, oh, well, I guess he died. So I got my men's group a couple days later, and I tell, I tell them about it. And uh, the next day, I get a phone call from one of the brothers in the men's group, and he says, Victor, they're talking about the, car, the truck accident on the radio, not on the secular radio, or on the secular radio, on the country radio station. They're talking about it. They're saying a man, a good Samaritan, stopped and uh, shared Jesus with the truck driver, and he lived. And I said, really? You think they're talking about me? He's like, who else can they be talking about? And they're looking for you. And I said, they're looking for me. Uh, who do I call? I don't know, but they're looking for you. I get another phone call later that day. Victor, have you seen the front page of the newspaper? No, I haven't seen the front page of the newspaper. But you're on the front page of the newspaper. So he sends me in. And the Chicago paper says, we're looking for the Good Samaritan. And it says, a man named Victor stopped and shared Jesus with me. And he saved my life. <laughs> and, man, I'm reading that and I'm just like, golly, he lives. Praise God. So I called the phone number. And I called, and it was the owner of the truck drive, the owner of the truck driving company. And I called, and I said, hi, my name is Victor. And he goes, Victor, we've been looking for you. We want to meet you. I said, sure. So I come down to the hospital, and I bring two of my brothers with me. And uh, there's 15 people waiting in the hospital room, waiting to meet me, shake my hand and take me. And I brought a Bible, and I read the Good Samaritan parable. Since the newspaper was calling me a good Samaritan, I figured I was sure of that. And I read that. And that's what we're called to be. We're called to stop. I think back at how many times I've seen an accident, and I was too worried about where I had to be. And I kept driving. I figured somebody else has got it. You know what? I got the Lord Jesus Christ living in me, man. I need to be stopping for every car accident. Because I have the power inside of me. God wants to use you and me. He wants to use everybody listening to this right now. He wants to use you. He wants you to heal the sick. Yeah, God could use angels, but he doesn't use angels. He uses us. It's our job to, to bring forth the good news of Jesus Christ. It's our job to bring healing. He can do it without us, but he chooses to use us. He, wants, he loves us. He wants to include us. Being a Christian is exciting. If, it's, if your Christian walk is boring, you're doing something wrong. Ever since I started walking this out, it's been the most exciting, craziest stuff ever. Let me tell you how much, so the guy's name is Keith. So I get to tell him how much God loved him. This is how much God loves Keith. All right? When I first moved to Chicago, the day I walked into my house, a guy knocked on the door and wanted to sell me a security system. I told him to get lost. And he, gave me, he gave me his business card. I told him I'd call him back. So I called him back to tell him to get lost. But I got his voicemail, and his voicemail said, Praise Jesus, thank you for calling me. And I had to change of heart. And I said, hey, why don't you come over? The guy came over and I said, hey, what's up with you loving Jesus? He, and he shared his whole testimony how he got delivered from drugs. And he told me what church to go to. And I went to that church. And there I made my best. And at that church, I became friends with a brother named Quentin. And he be, quickly became my best friend. He asked me. And he was the praise and worship leader. And he'd been praying, praying for somebody to come in there and fix the sound system. And that's what I was doing. God, when I walked in that church, God told me to fix the sound system. So I started fixing the sound system. He said, you've been a blessing to me. You're answered prayer. Why do you come to this church? I said, a couple months ago, a guy, ADT salesman, told me to come here. And he said, is his name Dave? I said, yeah. He goes, oh, hallelujah. I haven't seen Dave for years. He said, I was worried that he was back on drugs. I go, no, he's praising me. He loves the Lord. He told me to come here. He said, 
He said a couple of years ago, Dave was going to go to jail. I didn't know Dave. He showed up to my work site and he asked for $4,000 or else he was going to prison. God told me to give him $4,000. So I did. Quentin gave Dave, a stranger, $4,000. And Dave came back and worked off every penny. And God repaid Quentin for his obedience and, and brought us together. So Quentin got lost one day in, a, in, in Wisconsin. And he got lost in the man's parking lot. And there was a, a phone number on the, on the sign that said, Wild Heart Ministries for Men. And Quentin said, I want to find some real men. And he called the phone number. To this day, he's the only man to ever call that phone number. And the, the man that answered, his name was Bob. And Bob and Quentin and I are best friends now. And when God called me into the wilderness, he called Quentin at the same time. And he also called Bob. And we all met each other when we were just coming out into the wilderness. And Bob invited me over to his house. And I met Bob. And I was at Bob's house, and I met a young brother that wanted to become a rapper. And he had heard that I had made a rap video that was on BET. So he said, you know what, I'm going to make a rap video one day with you. And I said, fine, here's my card. One year later, he called me, and he said, it's time to make a rap video. And I said, you know what, I don't know if it is, because I just gave my business away. When I moved back to Chicago, God told me to give my business away to my employee. He's been a faithful, hardworking person. And I gave my entire business, all the cameras all the equipment, all the clientele, everything, gave it to him. And David is, is a great brother. He didn't know the Lord when he started working for me, but he did by the time he was done working for me. And now he's running my, my old business, and I, was good, and I was done with the video business. But God told me to make the rap video. So because I'd given my video cameras away, I had to go rent a video camera. So I went and rented a video camera. And that's why I had to go on 94 to return a video camera. And that's how much God loves Keith, the truck driver. And that all those things had, all those things happened. All these impossibilities were be, became possible because of just following God, listening to God's voice. You know, I've learned to live a lifestyle of fasting and praying finally. And you know what? I'm starting to hear God. And I used to hear people say, oh, God told me this, God told me that. And I used to think they were crazy. But you know what? I'm starting to become one of those crazy people because I'm starting to desire the things of God far more than the things of flesh. And uh, I wouldn't have it any other way, man.